Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. What do you suppose motivated the disciples to stop that man from driving out demons in Jesus' name? And it may be a good thing for us to ask if any of that motivation exists in us. Was it perhaps officiousness, standing on their important status as disciples of Jesus? There's some of that in all of us. I remember on my first day in grade two, some of us walking around looking for grade ones and saying to them officiously, go to your playground standing on our newfound important status as grade twos. Or perhaps they were motivated by a desire not to see someone else succeed. Sometimes we regard other people's success as a measure of our own failure and inadequacies. And you can find this in someone as sanctified as a Baptist minister. I know of a Baptist minister who admitted to us that on a Sunday morning, he sometimes couldn't resist driving past the charismatic church and counting the cars in their car park. And you can be assured he wasn't counting them in the hope that they were being successful. Or perhaps the disciples were motivated by something more sinister, and in fact they give a clue to that themselves, when they say, He is not one of us. Now that's a red light warning. It means they're living in the zone of us and them. In Galatians chapter 5, there's a list of dreadful works of the flesh. It includes sexual immorality, drunken orgies, and so on. But there was one that, as a child, I didn't understand in the King James Version. It was seditions. And then J.B. Phillips translated it, Always thinking your little group is right. It's the us and them syndrome. And it's the root of all racism, all discrimination, of so much pain and bloodshed in the world. Well, to change the subject completely, I've always carried a little fear that when I appear before Jesus, he won't accept me, I won't have been good enough. Now, he said some things that do give root to that fear. In Luke 14, 33, he says, Anyone who wants to be my disciple must give up everything he has. I certainly haven't given up everything I have. In Mark 10, he goes on to talk about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and wanted to follow him. And he said to him, first go and sell all your possessions, give it to the poor and come and follow me. And I've always been very aware of how very little I've actually done for the poor. But then in this passage, there are two very encouraging things that Jesus said, and I hold on to them. The first was, Whoever is not against me is for me. Now, that's a very inclusive sort of thing to say, isn't it? Of course, we know that across in Matthew, he said the opposite. He said, whoever's not for me is against me. What's going on here? Well, I think it's Jesus reading the heart. The one in Matthew, he was talking about the Pharisees, and he knew of their hypocrisy and their self-righteousness. And he warned them, if you're not for me, you're against me. But here he's talking about this man who may not know everything, he may not be one of the in-group, but he's following Jesus and he's having faith. And for him, Jesus says, if he's not against me, he's for me. In the ministry, I dealt with that contradiction, I think, by when I was speaking in public to the general populace, I would favor the Matthew verse and I would say, if you're not for him, you're against him, make sure You've made a commitment and you are living for him. But when I was dealing with the bereaved or at funerals, I tended to favor the second attitude. If you're not against him, you're for him. And so I would add into the funeral service after we'd said, we commit him to the earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I would add, and we commit his spirit to the wideness of your mercy. And this passage certainly shows the wideness of God's mercy. The second sentence I'm very grateful for is he said, anyone who gives so much as a cup of cold water to one of my disciples will receive his reward. Jesus will reward us even for a cup of cold water. I often think about the poor old innkeeper in the Christmas story, just gave a manger, but to be fair to him, he didn't have any spare rooms and at least he gave a manger. And if a manger is all we can give, then we give that. And if the Christmas story tells us anything, it tells us that God can take a manger and turn it into a place of wonder. 
In the 1970s, in the dark apartheid years, there was a wicked system. Old black people could get a very small pension, but they had to appear in person to collect it. I saw old people dragged along there in wheelbarrows like a bag of bones. And the collection point in Soweto was the middle of an open field. Have you ever been in an open field in a cold winter's morning in Johannesburg? And they used to arrive very early because sometimes the money ran out. So a group of churches got together and arranged a soup kitchen and one day I was handing out some soup and bread and I came to an old lady and I gave her a yogurt cup of soup and two slices of bread with some margarine on it and I said to her, I'm sorry it's so little. And she looked up at me and she said, Never say it's little. If you give it in Jesus' name, it can become much. Mm -hmm.